Heavenly Father, we ask that right now, in these moments, by the power of your Spirit working through your Word, you would speak clearly to us, that we would understand, hearing full well what you have to say, and that we would believe the Word you have spoken so that we would not be mere hearers of the word, but doers of it. Oh, that it may be so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I ask that you would remain standing as you're able for the reading of our sermon text. We continue in our study of the book of Romans. And this morning we come to Romans chapter 10, verses 14 through 21. Romans 10, 14 through 21. I ask that you would listen carefully as I read, for this is the very word of God. The Apostle Paul writes, But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us. So faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. But I ask, have they not heard? Indeed, they have. For their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Then Isaiah is so bold as to say, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. But of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and contrary people. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds the reading of his word. You may be seated. Well, what we are doing right now in this moment may seem rather ordinary, even mundane. Some may even call it boring. I have no doubt that if you look across the room carefully over the next 30 minutes, you may see someone dozing off. I do every week. You might even find your own mind beginning to wander as you consider the many important things you have to do today or in the week to come. And what's the big deal, right? It's just a sermon. But I tell you that what is happening right now in the reading and preaching of the Bible, it is the most important thing that will happen to you today or this week or even in your whole life. Now you say to yourself, well, this preacher is pretty full of himself, isn't he? He thinks he's pretty important. But rest assured, the importance of the next 30 minutes or so has nothing to do with Aaron Messner. But it has everything to do with what I say if if I faithfully expound the written word of God. If I faithfully explain to you in the coming moments what the Bible says, if I faithfully apply the word of God to your lives, then something altogether remarkable takes place. God speaks to you through me. If the written word of God is faithfully expounded in the coming moments, then none other than the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching to you. You are being addressed by the Lord and his supernatural word has the power to save and sanctify your soul unto eternal life and glory. That is in part what the apostle Paul wants us to understand from our sermon text this morning. Romans 10, 14 through 21. But before we just jump right into this text, which is at least part is familiar to many, Let's take a few moments just to remind ourselves of the context here in these verses. These verses, verses 14, 15, and 17 in particular, are prone to being plucked out of context 
so that they lose their connection to Paul's argument. So we want to make sure we see this passage in the context of what Paul is trying to argue here. So I remind you that from the beginning of Romans, chapters 1 through 8 in particular, Paul has been preaching to us the glorious gospel of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And now, having done that in a glorious way, he, he, begin, he moves into chapters 9 through 11, and, he, and Paul is keenly aware that the preaching of this glorious gospel has produced two strange and unlikely communities. On the one hand, it has produced a community of unlikely unbelievers. And Paul is here thinking of the majority of his countrymen, the Jews, though their existence as a people was leading up to this moment, they have by and large rejected Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. They've rejected Jesus as Savior and Lord. And, and while this is going on, on the other hand, the, the preaching of the gospel has produced a very unlikely community of believers. Because Gentiles from all sorts of pagan backgrounds, full of idolatry and immorality, they have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Crucified and risen, they have believed and they have been saved and they've been brought into the fellowship of the church. And so the preaching of Paul's gospel has produced a world that in many ways is upside down. It's completely unexpected. And in this topsy-turvy world, a world of Jewish unbelief on the one hand and Gentile belief on the other, it's, that's produced a lot of questions. It's made many wonder, what kind of gospel is this? And what kind of God is this? And why has this strange result come to pass? This then is what Paul is exploring here in Romans 9 through 11. He's argued that this strange result has come to pass on the one hand as the result of God's sovereignty in election. And yet, as clearly as Paul has made that case, at the same time he argues that this result has come to pass because of choices that human beings have made. For Paul says, a word has gone forth. A word of the gospel that is in fact near and able to save all who believe in it and some have believed this word, and some have not. So now as we come to verses 14 through 21, Paul wants to take a closer look at the hearing of this word. If the word of the gospel is, is near to all who hear it, if it is in fact in their mouths, in their hearts, and, and that anyone, Jew or Gentile, can believe in it and be saved, then what? shall we say, about the hearing of this word. So as we consider our verses for this morning, we see that they divide into two major themes. The, in the first section, Paul reveals the necessity of the preaching of the word. And then in the second section, he reveals the necessity of believing the preached word that is heard. The necessity of the preaching of the word and the necessity of believing the word that is preached. So let's consider each in turn. Having declared in verse 13 that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved, Paul then takes a step back. And he essentially asks, okay, what has to happen in order for someone to be able to call on the Lord and be saved? And as he walks that back, he identifies a number of steps that have to take place in order for this saving call to take place. And as scholar John Murray says, the logical sequence set forth here scarcely needs comments. By that, Murray means it's pretty clear. The main point, Murray continues, is that the saving relation to Christ involved in calling upon his name is not something that can occur in a vacuum. It occurs only in a context created by the proclamation of the gospel on the part of those commissioned to proclaim it. So as Paul walks backwards, he identifies the following sequence. 
He says, in order for someone to actually call on the name of the Lord to be saved, well, they have to believe in the Lord. And in order for anyone to believe in the Lord, they have to have heard about the Lord. And in order for people to have heard about the Lord, someone has to have preached about the Lord from the word. And in order for people to preach about the Lord, preachers have to be commissioned and sent. Paul identifies a very basic structure, a a clear paradigm here, where the Lord himself sends out preachers through the church to herald the good news of the gospel. The preachers declare the the word of salvation through the saving promises of God. And, And through these preachers, then, people hear the word. And through hearing the word, they believe in the word. And in believing the word, they call out to God for salvation and they are saved. This is the primary way, the primary pattern by which God has always worked to bring about the salvation of his people. God's working to get his word to the world through the preaching of the gospel is not just some modern cultural methodology which seems effective in some contexts. No, it's God's primary way of getting his word out to people in every time and place. God sends out preachers to herald the word to the world. This is why Paul here in his first century Greco-Roman context can appeal to Isaiah in his eighth century before Christ Hebrew context and say in a universal way, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. Now, in the Old Testament, many of you will know, God regularly raised up prophets who would go before the people, go before kings, go before nations, and they would preach God's word. They would call people back to God's word. They, they would warn people concerning judgment and promise them coming salvation. That's what happened in the Old Testament. And so it was in Paul's day, where the Lord Jesus Christ himself preached the good news of the kingdom In fact, Jesus declared that was the reason for which he came out, was to preach the good news. So Jesus preached about himself, that he was the Savior of all, and and that Jesus then commissioned and sent out apostles to preach in his name. And the apostles were used by God to raise up churches who would then continue to commission men to preach the word by laying hands upon chosen brothers like we see with Timothy in 1 Timothy 4. Now, to be sure, every believer, each and every one of you, has the opportunity to share the gospel with those around him. So one need not be an appointed leader and preacher in the church in order to share the word of Christ. But what Paul is highlighting here in these verses is the importance and even the necessity of this formal preaching ministry. You might say the church rises or falls on the basis of its formal preaching ministry. And and what is striking here is not just a, a statement that preaching is important, but that Paul, I think, argues here that through the preaching of the word, by those commissioned and sent out to preach it, through this preaching, Jesus Christ himself is speaking and preaching his word. I think you can see this, uh, the authoritative nature of this preaching in verse 14. The ESV says, And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? Now, what's interesting to note here is that in the Greek, there's no preposition in before the word him. And many esteemed scholars and pastors, such as John Murray or Sinclair Ferguson, they they argue very clearly, no preposition should be added there. Murray says this so clearly. He says, there is no need to insert the preposition in before him. So, So the argument here is that the text actually should read, how are they to believe him whom they have not heard? 
And I think what, what's significant about that is there's a striking idea here that Paul is putting forward. And what he's saying is that in faithful gospel preaching, the listener is not just hearing a preacher talk about Christ, but that in faithful gospel preaching, the listener is hearing Christ himself address the hearer. So that as one hears faithful proclamation of the gospel from the scriptures, one can rightly say, as we will sing later in this service, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come unto me and live. This, as John Murray says, this is the ordinary and yet effectual means of propagating the gospel, namely, the official preaching of the word by those appointed to this task. And in such preaching, Jesus himself is making his gospel known. And if this is the case, and I believe it is, then I'd like to make three simple applications for us today. The first is this, get thee to a preacher. Get thee to a preacher, for there is nothing more important than that you would call on the name of the Lord and be saved. And that call will only happen if you believe, and that you will, you will only believe if you hear, and you will only hear if someone preaches. So I tell you, regular reading and preaching of the word, Re the regular reading and preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it is the great and preeminent means by which God speaks to you. In the reading and preaching of his written word, Christ himself speaks his very word, the word that is able to save you and sanctify your soul unto eternal glory. So what you need this morning and every morning. What you need every Lord's day is as a matter of eternal import and value is to sit under the regular reading and preaching of the word of God. Again, I say the, the reading and preaching of the word is the primary means that God uses to save and sanctify the souls of his people. It's the primary means that God uses to mold and shape the hearts and the minds and the lives of his people. It is of inestimable value. Not because I am of inestimable value. No, this, this preaching comes in the cloak of human weakness and frailty. It is ordinary and mundane, even foolish. And yet, by God's own design, it is the means by which Christ himself instructs his people unto life eternal. So, brothers and sisters, get yourself under the preaching of the word. Be present in the worship of God's people, which must be centered around the reading and preaching of God's word. And if you find yourself looking for a church, now or in the future, before you think about the church's demographic, looking around to say, are there people here like me? Before you think about the church's architecture or its activities or its worship music, you must find a church that faithfully preaches God's word week in and week out. For apart from such preaching, people will not be saved and sanctified unto glory. Now, just a word of personal comment here. I know that at times my own preaching has been criticized for being so closely tied to the text. As perhaps this makes it less interesting than it could be. It has been said of my preaching in a negative way. He preaches the text the whole sermon. <laughs> or... All he does is tell us what the Bible says. Or, and this came from a fellow PCA pastor, he could be much more compelling as a preacher if he didn't feel such a burden to be expository. Now, perhaps I could be more interesting. Perhaps I could tell more stories. Perhaps I could have more funny jokes. 
And I want to be clear, I'm not criticizing those who utilize such rhetorical devices well. I will simply say this. I believe the scriptures to be the very word of God. And that through them, Christ himself speaks and preaches to you. And so when I preach, I want his word to be clear. I want it to be in the forefront as much as possible. I want you to hear the text. I want you to hear Christ in and through the word. I I don't want you to come away thinking about my rhetoric and my stories and my humor and my ingenuity because by those things, no one will be saved. It is only in hearing his living and active word that you will be saved. And so that is why I endeavor to preach as I do. Whether it be good or poor, I leave that up to you. But that is why I endeavor to preach as I do. And so I say to you, even if it is not here at Westminster Presbyterian Church, get yourself to a faithful preacher each and every Lord's day so that you may hear Christ in whom you must believe. And that now a second application of this truth is this, that, that the church, particularly its elders, but also its members, we must pray for, insist on, and hold the preacher accountable to provide continual faithful exposition of God's word. The truth is that many churches perish for lack of faithful preaching of the word. And the truth is that in many of those churches where the pulpit ministry is now unfaithful, the word was once faithfully preached. You see, people don't tend to plant unfaithful churches that have already rejected the word of God. It's possible, but it doesn't happen that often. No, faithful churches tend to drift over time away from the word and thus become unfaithful. So we say, well, how then does a church remain faithful now and into the future? One is by being a praying people today, but also then by having diligent elders who insist on the faithful preaching of the word today and who holds the preacher accountable today. And... It happens when there are church members who are like the Bereans in Acts 17, who listen to the preaching of the word and then search the scriptures to see if these things are so. So we must place ourselves under the faithful preaching of the word, and then we must work together as a church to insist on and ensure that the faithful preaching of the word continues week after week after week. And finally, then, a third point of application. If this is true, we must do what we can as a church to send the preaching of the word forth. If they cannot call on him whom they have not believed, and if they cannot believe in him whom they have never heard, and they cannot hear without someone preaching to them, and if they cannot preach unless they are sent, then the church needs to send as much as possible. The church needs to raise up and send preachers into the world so that all may hear and believe and be saved. As Paul says, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of Christ. So the church needs to prayerfully and sacrificially send forth preachers and missionaries into the world. And this can take many forms. Sending can be a a local act. In the form of church planting. You know, there are more people in this city worshiping each Lord's Day because Westminster Presbyterian Church planted Tucker Presbyterian Church just a few miles down the road. And yet, while this sending can surely be local, it must also be global. Because the truth is that today, Right now, there are billions of people in the world who have never heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. Countless men and women and children who do not believe because they never heard, because a gospel preacher has has never been sent to them. And we say, what can be done? Churches like ours can pray. As our brother Joe led us us in prayer, we can pray that God would raise up more laborers for the harvest fields. 
And in the words of the old hymn, we, we can give of our sons to bear the message glorious. Give of our wealth to speed them on their way. Pour out our souls for them in prayer victorious. And all our spending, Jesus will repay. May it be so then that you as an individual and we as a church, may, may we be a people who rally to the faithful preaching of the word. May we hear the voice of Christ speaking to us unto salvation. May we prayerfully labor to uphold the preaching of the work week after week, year after year, generation after generation. And may we send. May we send forth gospel preachers to plant churches in this city and around the world until the Lord Jesus Christ returns. For faith comes by hearing. Hearing through the word of Christ, through the faithful proclamation of the Lord's preachers. Now, it would be really nice to close in prayer at this point. <laughs> we could say, okay, as long as there's preaching, everything's okay, right? All people have to do is hear the word and they'll be saved, right? Well, as Paul makes it very clear in these verses, that is not necessarily the case. Oh, there is a necessity for the preaching of the word. But that is not the whole story, is it? For the preached word must still be believed and obeyed. Remember, Paul is not here speaking at a missions conference, plucking verses 14, 15, and 17 out of context just to say, send out preachers. He is wrestling with the topsy-turvy reality of of these two surprising communities that have sprung up in response to faithful gospel preaching. Again, on the one hand, there's, there's Gentile believers who come from idolatry and immorality, but they've heard the word of God preached to them. That word has been brought near to them through the preaching of the gospel and they believed and they've called upon the Lord and they've been saved and we say, hallelujah. That then once again raises the question, right? What, what about the Jews? What about the majority of Paul's countrymen who do not believe in Jesus as the Christ, as Savior and as Lord? Paul says in verse 16, they have not all obeyed the gospel, have they? For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed what he has heard from us? So, so we ask, where did this break down? Paul then goes on to ask a series of questions to try to get to the heart of this breakdown. First, he asks in verse 18, have they not heard? I mean, they have not believed the gospel. They have not obeyed the gospel. Maybe it's because they haven't heard the gospel. Maybe no one has sent them a preacher. But Paul answers, no, that's not it. For he says, indeed, they have heard. And he then quotes from Psalm 19. He says, their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. Now, this is a very interesting quote because if you go back and look this up in Psalm 19, what you see is that this verse is actually referring to general revelation. The general revelation that comes from the created order. The psalmist is saying that the heavens declare the glory of God so that the witness of God's glory has gone out to the ends of the world through what has been made. This is a very similar idea to what Paul actually says in Romans 1, right? Remember when he, when, when he says that because of the witness of God in creation, everybody has heard and no one has any excuse. But what Paul seems to be doing here is is taking this quote and really using it to refer to the whole of Psalm 19. You, you may know the, the first half of Psalm 19 is about the witness of creation. And the second half is about the witness of the written word, the very law of God. And what Paul seems to be arguing here is that in a similar fashion to the way God has provided general revelation concerning his existence to the whole world through creation, he is now in a similar way providing specific revelation of his salvation to the whole world through gospel preaching. Where did Paul get this? Well, I think he got it from Jesus, right? 
Passages like Matthew 24, 14, where Jesus says, this gospel of the kingdom will be proclaimed through the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Jesus then clearly sent forth his disciples to make disciples of all nations through the preaching of his gospel. And he called them in Acts 1 to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what Paul sees here is the gospel going out to all the earth, to the ends of the world in the same pattern that was true for general revelation. And Paul knows all too well that his countrymen have indeed heard the gospel preached to them. Many of them heard it preached by Jesus himself. Many more heard it preached from Paul himself as he made it his custom to go into every city and to begin his ministry by preaching in the synagogues. So no, the problem is not that his countrymen have not heard the gospel. They most certainly have. So that then raises another question. Well, have they, have they not understood it? Was it too difficult to understand? Was it unclear? Paul argues it was not too difficult and it was not unclear. He then quotes from Deuteronomy 32, 21, in, in which Moses tells Israel, I will make you jealous by those who are not a nation. With a foolish nation, I will make you angry. Now, the immediate context of those verses is that the Lord was going to use foreign nations as instruments of judgment on Israel when they rebelled against the Lord. But here, Paul interprets them to say that God will make the Gentile, the, the, he will make the Israelites jealous not by physically destroying Israel by the Gentiles, but by having the Gentiles believe the very promises that were made to Israel. Promises of salvation and life, promises that find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And the fact then that these promises are grasped and received by a foolish nation Nations without understanding demonstrates that, number one, th these promises are not too difficult to understand because they were actually embraced by foolish nations without understanding. And two, it's a reminder that Israel was warned of these realities by Moses himself. They had ample time and ample warning from, their, from the scriptures to embrace the promises of the gospel. Paul then goes on to add Isaiah's voice to Moses by quoting Isaiah 65, 1 and 2. He says, I have been found by those who did not seek me. I have shown myself to those who did not ask for me. He's speaking there of the Gentiles, but then he contrasts that and says, but of Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hand to a disobedient and contrary people. You see, the problem was not that Israel had not heard. No, the word had been made clear to them by, their, by Israel's own prophets and through the preaching of the gospel. And the problem was not that they did not understand as if the word was too difficult for them. No, the fact that the foolish Gentiles who have no understanding were able to understand it and embrace it means that the problem was not with the word. The problem was with Israel itself. The problem was that they chose to reject the word that had been clearly given to them. They responded to the word, as the text says, with disobedience and a contrary spirit. Again, Paul cites Isaiah here as, as a source of uh, saying, look, this is, this is what Israel has done again and again and again. They rejected the prophets of old. They've rejected the preaching of Christ. They rejected the preaching of the apostles in Paul's own day. And what all of this makes very clear is that while hearing the word is necessary for salvation, simply hearing the word is not sufficient for salvation. Now, we will wrestle in the coming weeks with, okay, so what about Israel? But in these final moments, I want to say, so what about us? Well, what Paul is saying here is one must actually receive and believe the word that is heard. Oh, God in his grace and long-suffering character has held out his hands to Israel all day long. He's given his word of salvation to them again and again and again. And so it is today. 
there are places who have not yet heard the word of the gospel. It has not been preached to them. But there are many, perhaps many here today, who have heard the word of the Lord again and again and again. And despite all the hearing, they, perhaps you, continually reject that word and are not saved. This is a perpetual warning to us in the scriptures. Paul here speaks of Israel's failures from the Old Testament and in his own day. But the New Testament repeatedly warns all people to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers of the word. James 1.22. The author of Hebrews says that the good news came to us just as to them. He's talking about the Israelites in the Old Covenant. He says, but the message they heard did not benefit them because they were not united by faith with those who listened. You see, what we see is that the precious word of God, which is able to make one wise unto salvation, which is able to sanctify you for every good work, that word must be preached, but the preached word must be believed in order for it to bear the fruit of salvation. It must be heard but it cannot only be heard. It must be believed and obeyed. The listener must respond to that word in faith. And so here we are this morning, as we are on each Lord's Day. The word is being preached. The word from Christ concerning Christ. The message rings forth through all of Romans that Christ died for our sins and he rose from the grave for our salvation. He rules and reigns over all and he is coming again to make all things new. And right now you are hearing his word. Right now God is holding his hands out to you. His voice is going out to you. His words go out to you. And the question is, will you believe it? Do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, crucified and risen as your Lord and Savior? Are you not only hearing the word, are you understanding it? And are you believing it and calling upon the Lord in faith? This, of course, was Paul's great prayer for his countrymen. That they would not only hear as they had heard, but that they would believe and be saved. And this is my prayer for you. And this must be our prayer for one another and for those we love and for those who are far off. That all would hear the preaching of the word. And in hearing, they would believe and be saved. Oh, that that they, that you, that we, we would not be like those who hear the word of Christ and do not do it. Jesus says, that makes us fools who build our houses on the sand. But oh, may we be like those who build our house on the rock. For we hear the word of Christ concerning Christ, and we believe it. And we obey it. And we do so unto the salvation and sanctification of our souls. May it be so. May it be so. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we pray that even now we would be able to sing in faith. I heard the voice of Jesus say, and that we would be able to say in faith, we responded to that word unto the salvation of our souls. May it be so. May we then Seek out that word for our continued edification. May we hold fast to that word as a church. May we send forth preachers to bring that word even to the ends of the world. Oh, Lord, may it be so. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.